I think the battle for America's future will be won or lost based on what happens in American uh, universities. Do we maintain our technological uh, supremacy? Do our ideas and our ideals continue to be an example to the rest of uh, the world? This is A New Angle, and I'm your host, Justin Angle, marketing professor at the University of Montana. This podcast is my chance to speak with cool people doing awesome things in and around the great state of Montana. This show is proudly presented by First Security Bank and Blackfoot Communications. All right, welcome back, and thanks for tuning in today. Today's episode is the first in a series of four episodes in which we explore topics of critical importance in the upcoming midterm elections. You know, here at the podcast, we can't tell you how to vote, but we can encourage you to vote, and we hope that highlighting these issues in this podcast will provide such motivation. If you need information on how to register and where your polling station is, visit BallotReady.org. Okay, I am really excited to bring you today's episode. A couple weeks ago, I had the great pleasure and honor of visiting with Larry Summers. Larry was visiting Montana as part of a road trip vacation through the American West, and he was kind enough to stop by the University of Montana and engage with our community in multiple ways, including this podcast. Professor Summers is one of the preeminent scholars and public servants of our time. He served as Secretary of the Treasury under President Clinton, was Chief Economist of the World Bank, served as President of Harvard University from 2001 to 2006, served as President Obama's Chief Economist during the financial crisis, and and is now back at Harvard doing his research, mentoring students, and speaking out about a variety of important topics. We used our time together to discuss freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and the importance of ideas on college campuses. This is a topic on which Larry speaks with great passion and eloquence. It's also a topic I think about constantly, as it is fundamental to what we do at a university I really enjoyed my time with Larry and thank him for sharing his thoughts with all of us. So without further delay, I bring you Larry Summer. Okay, so we're here today with Larry Summers. Larry, welcome to Montana. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Very glad to be here and very glad to be at the University of Montana. And you said this is your second time to the state, but haven't been here in about 20 years. That's right. Uh, my wife and I are driving across uh the country. It's my wife's 60th birthday, and she has always wanted to drive across the country and never done it. And so she has been uh, driving since since uh, she left Boston almost two weeks ago. And I met up with her in Chicago, and we've been in uh, Iowa and in Minnesota and in South Dakota, in Wyoming, and now we're here in uh, Montana. Awesome. And she's doing all the driving. She's doing almost all. She's doing almost all the driving because she likes it that way, and it was her trip. And I told her she could plan it however she uh, wanted to. And we've had a uh, great time, and we've seen how big a country uh, America is, and how beautiful a country is, and looks very different. Yeah, uh, and a, seems very different than it often does uh, living in Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. It's a great way to kind of understand the expanse. Of land and range of people that live in this place. You do have a sense that uh, it's a country of almost infinite uh, capacity. As you drive, you know, huge, you can go for many, as you know better than I, many, many miles uh, without seeing any one or anything that got made by man, but seeing things that are really awesomely uh, beautiful. The Badlands, the Black Hills, the Big Sky Mm -hmm. uh, country, it's really been uh, quite something. Yeah, and you know, it's funny, I grew up in in New Hampshire, so not far from, you know, where you're stationed now, and I think my daughters and I once 
looked at the map. I think he could fit 17 New Hampshires within the space uh, of Montana. So, yeah, the, the, the scale suspect, is just different. I suspect that's right. And I suspect you could fit quite a few uh, Harvard squares um, <laughs> I, in the campus of the University of Montana. I was, I was reading about the uh, congressional grant of land that was given that helped start this university. And I think I calculated from the acreage figures that it was about 75 square miles. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, that's the whole Boston area. Yeah, so we own the mountain behind the school, really too. really quite <laughs> something. It's really uh, quite, a, uh, quite a remarkable thing. Yeah. So as I was preparing for this interview, this chance to speak with you, I, you know, I was looking, thinking about how many different spheres of influence you've operated in over the course of the year and just the over the course of the years and just the the scope of your kind of personal network and then i was sort of looking at your wife lisa's work with poetry in america and what she does and it's hard to really determine who's got the more impressive network absolutely uh lisa's really done phenomenal uh things uh over a million people have watched in one way or another uh her TV show on uh, Poetry in America. She's got a deep commitment. She's going to be talking about it while she's here at the university to the idea that uh, the humanities should not be an ascetic discipline of scholars talking in five-syllable words to other scholars, right. but uh, can reach everyone and change the way they think about beauty, change the way they think about uh, themselves and uh, their world. And she's really done fantastic things. I'm not objective, but I think in making that real uh, with this TV series and with all this educational uh, programming uh, that uh, she's developing. Sometimes it's a bit too cultures with uh, her interest in... uh, poetry and my being uh, more on the number crunching uh, side, but uh, we learn a lot from each other. Absolutely. And just the range of sort of people in her collaborative sphere. I mean, Shaquille O'Neal on one end, Bill Clinton, Joe Biden, like just the list of people is amazing. No, well, it shows that uh, poetry uh, really reaches large numbers of people who you wouldn't think of as uh, poets and Mm -hmm. when people are in the position they stop being a pro basketball player or a president and they're just a person trying to make sense um of uh of a poem yeah lisa's really very good at making it uh not an encounter with a celebrity but an encounter with a fellow person right right and and Thinking about what I'd love to engage you on today, Larry, is you know poetry is a form of expression, and expression and speech is 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 something I'd like to kind of get your thoughts on. You know, from from one viewpoint, if you look at universities uh, in the United States right now, you might think things are humming along, and those institutions maybe are are not changing enough with the time. And other um, another viewpoint is that there's kind of a crisis on college campuses and a crisis of, of what's permissible to talk about and not talk about. And, you know, I know that's, that's touched your world at Harvard. It's kind of come to our world in the last couple of years at University of Montana. And I guess broadly, I just say, you know, how do you view the, the sort of the rise of, or the resurgence of political correctness on college campuses and beyond in the last few years? Let me just say a couple things, uh, Justin. I've spent almost all my life in universities, uh, except for the time I spent uh, in public service in uh, Washington doing economic policy. Uh, My whole life has been uh, in universities. Many years ago, uh, the Duke of Wellington famously said that uh, the Battle of Waterloo had been won on the playing fields of Eton, Mm -hmm. the great British prep school. And I think the battle for America's future will be won or lost based on what happens in American uh, universities. Do we maintain our technological uh, supremacy? 
do our ideas and our ideals continue to be an example to the rest of uh, the world? Is a next generation ready to take uh, the baton at a very challenging uh, moment uh, from the generation that's in power now? All those things will depend centrally on what happens in American uh, universities. I think American universities are a great national strength. If you think about the number of students from all over the world who want to come and study uh, in American universities, they are a magnet uh, for uh, talent. They show uh, the power of uh, the American uh, example. They are the reason why we are the place mm -hmm. where uh, Silicon Valley uh, happened. They are the source, in important respects, of great progress. The change in the role of women we've had over the last half century, mm -hmm. important parts of the civil rights uh, revolution, important parts of uh, the gay rights uh, revolution. These things came out of universities, and they are very, very positive uh, things. We have too little equality of opportunity in the United States, but important parts of the equality of opportunity that we do have come uh, from what happens in American universities. I do think there's an important challenge in American universities. I think that a substantial part of their greatness has come from the fact that they are human institutions that are governed by the authority of ideas rather than by the idea of authority. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was president of Harvard some years ago and uh, had come back to Harvard having been the secretary of the treasury, I taught a freshman seminar and I assigned a speech I had given as treasury, the treasury secretary about financial crises. Okay. And this 17 year old freshman was asked to discuss the reading and my lecture was, my speech was one of the readings. And he said, um, Professor Summers uh, speech was kind of interesting, but the data did not come close to proving the conclusions. Interesting. Well, I didn't think he was right to say that. I didn't think he was substantively right. But I did think what a fantastic thing it was in how many other human institutions could a 17-year-old sure. who'd been there for three weeks tell the guy who had the title president and who used to be one of the top government officials of his country that he didn't know what he was talking about and have nobody think it was odd or a big deal. Mm -hmm. Well, that is the glory of uh, American universities, that when a student discovers that her professor's favorite theory isn't really consistent with the data, the professor cheers that discovery on. And so it is that openness, that idea that we're never going to find the ultimate perfect truth, but by arguing and studying and debating and analyzing and measuring, we can get closer to that truth. Mm. That is the glory of American universities. But I do think there is a challenge and a problem, which is there is a growing idea that universities should be places that are comfortable and right. that universities should be places that are comfortable for students and that people shouldn't be exposed to things that they experience as aggressions, mm -hmm. that they shouldn't be exposed to ideas that trigger them that make them uncomfortable. And I have exactly the opposite view. If you're a student and you want to be comfortable, you should go home to your bedroom in your parents' house. 
an education that doesn't cause you some moments of discomfort about things you have believed Mm -hmm. is not a valuable education. An education that doesn't ask you to think about choices where there's no good choice is an education that is not worth having. A education that isn't threatening in uh, some ways doesn't prepare you for the rough and tumble of the world you're going to be in, whether it's in business or in farming or in law or in politics or what have you. So I think the growing idea that some ideas, because they cause distress, shouldn't be open for debate, Mm -hmm. which is an idea that we have more and more on more college campuses, I think is a deeply, deeply uh, problematic kind of idea. Now, this has gotten hard in recent years because I think it's hugely wrong, and I think it's particularly wrong when ideas that are censored, um, because too many of the ideas that are fashionable on college campuses, I sometimes think aren't very good ones. Uh, Mm -hmm. I was appalled when I was president of Harvard that Harvard wouldn't support um, an ROTC program uh, for its students because Harvard disapproved of the gays in the military policy. Mm -hmm. Well, I disapproved of the gays in the military policy, too. I disapproved of it passionately. And students couldn't list that as a... But it seemed to... Couldn't list it in their yearbook. Yeah. But it... Let me say that again. If they were a member of the ROTC, they had to go to... You had to go to MIT. Somebody had to pay for it off the books, and they couldn't list it in their Harvard yearbook. Sure. Now... I didn't like the gays in the military policy, but it had been chosen by elected presidents, ratified by elected uh, congresses, and we were citizens, it seemed to me. And who were we to withdraw from the obligations of, of of citizenship? So I think that it becomes more problematic when... Ideas that are important to our country Mm -hmm. um, and that reflect traditions of our country become problematic on too many campuses. At the same time, I have stopped using the word political correctness. Okay. Not because people who use it aren't referring to a real issue. I, I... made that clear that I didn't think microaggressions Mm -hmm. was a sensible concept. Uh, I've heard the stories about uh, law, criminal law classes where people, where they don't teach about the crime of rape because it causes discomfort uh, for some people, even though the much more enlightened understandings we have today come out of, of that crime come out of the work of legal scholars. So there's a real problem. At the same time, I have to say that many of the people who complain about political correctness on college campuses, I don't think are so much standing up for free speech, which is right, Mm -hmm. as standing up for giving bigotry a great shot, which is wrong. And so political correctness has come too often to be used by too many as a code word for racism is fine. Mm. And it isn't. And sexism isn't fine either. It's just a question of whether you respond to things that are wrong by trying to shut down conversation and debate or whether you do it with the power of argument. And I think that what universities of all institutions have to stand for 
is the power of argument over the argument of power. And that means being willing to hear any view, sure. but confronting that view with its foolishness, with its immorality, with its lack of intellectual basis. Shine a light if on that's it. What, uh, if that's what there is. And that's the philosophy that, that I've always advocated. But when I see speakers being disinvited okay. from uh, campuses, when I see certain subjects being certain texts not able to be taught uh, in uh, classes, when I see the idea that, for example, um, you can't say or you're advised in certain universities not to say that meritocracy is a good thing, mm -hmm. I have to say that causes me a lot of uh, trouble. But I think it's too easy to let the genuine cause of free speech be hijacked right. um, by those whose commitment isn't to any kind of openness, but who just want a pass to be bigoted and uh, provocative. And that's why I think there's a very, very difficult balance to be struck. Okay, I want to tell you about a really cool event coming up here at the University of Montana. Our entertainment management program will co-host the inaugural Montana Music Summit here at the University of Montana on Friday and Saturday, October 12th and 13th. This two-day conference in the Gallagher Business Building will bring together artists, entertainment executives, college students, entrepreneurs, and visionaries to present, educate, and share ideas about the evolving entertainment landscape. You got to check out this event if you have any interest in entertainment, any interest in music. Check out their website, montanamusicsummit.com, for information on the panelists, how to get tickets, and how to get involved. Check it out. This is going to be a really fun event. This is University of Montana President Seth Bodner, and you're listening to A New Angle. And so when you're talking about that balance, you know, you were in this seat at Harvard for a number of years as the president. I mean, as a leader of an institution that represents a marketplace of ideas, how do you view making decisions about bringing ideas, you know, welcoming ideas into that community such that, you know, th you talked about speakers getting canceled. Like what, what qualifies somebody to be invited or disinvited or, you know, at what point does the person gain the, the sort of credibility with their ideas to bring them to the conversation, if that makes sense? I think one needs to distinguish quite sharply a couple things. Um, nobody's got a right to be honored. Mm -hmm. And so if you're honoring people who one doesn't think should be honored, that should be an active matter of debate. and Nobody has a right to be honored. On the other hand, I think in a university community, any faculty member, any reasonable sized student group that wants to invite someone to speak because they want to hear them should be entirely free okay. to invite them to speak and to hear them. And they should be able to be heard without being interrupted. That doesn't mean they should be allowed to be heard without being questioned. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean they should be allowed to be heard without being challenged, but they should have a right to be heard. So no one has a right to be honored, but everyone who someone wants to hear has a uh, right to be heard. And I think that responsible universities have an obligation to try to present some spectrum of uh, points of uh, view. Now, there's no hard and fast way to draw this. Uh, I don't think the astronomy department is under an obligation to present the views of astrologers. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think the biology department is under an obligation to present the repudiated views of creationists. But when there are live political controversies in the land that have large number of adherents on uh, both sides, I, I think that uh, over time, all those points of view should be uh, represented uh, in a university community. And while my own preferences, uh, shown by the governments that I worked in, are, I'm a Democrat, are left of uh, center, I understand the concern that at some, and sympathize with the concern that at some of our leading universities, including the one I led, mm -hmm. um, conservative viewpoints or middle American uh, viewpoints are uh, often underrepresented. Uh, right. I believed, I signed a brief um, as president of Harvard to the Supreme Court supporting affirmative action. But there are arguments that are against affirmative action. And when the position is taken that nobody can oppose affirmative action on a college campus, that seems to it's me to be really quite uh, problematic. Right. Right. And so, you know, thinking about how other institutions operate, and maybe it's just a case of bad management. I mean, I think about what happened recently with the New Yorker conference. You know, they invite, David Remnick invited Steve Bannon to be the keynote or a, a participant. And then they had to rescind that after most of the other participants said, we didn't want to be on the stage with Steve Bannon. I mean, how can institutions that want to be a marketplace of ideas, I mean, I think the New Yorker has a good track record of that. How can they handle this situation better? You know, I am, one of the things I've learned uh, in my time in leadership positions is that you make decisions on complex, difficult matters and you do it knowing a lot of things and with a lot of considerations, some of which you can't comfortably explain. And it's very difficult from the outside to judge. Mm -hmm. So what the New Yorker should have done isn't something uh, that I feel I can sensibly comment on not knowing sure. all their things. I did speak at a conference last week that The Economist magazine um, sponsored where prior to my speech, Steve Bannon was interviewed and I welcomed the opportunity to attack uh, his views sure. and felt that I was able more vigorously and effectively to attack his views because he had had an opportunity to uh, present uh, his views. I think universities need to be very careful about not accepting and even not extending and even more about rescinding invitations because of threats that B won't come if A is invited. Right. I would have been very reluctant during my time as president of Harvard and on the smaller scale I'm at today, uh, running a center at Harvard. I think if somebody told me I should disinvite somebody I had already invited or they wouldn't come and speak, right. I think I would have said, we'll do without your uh, will do without your speech. Yeah. Uh, I think it's particularly problematic once someone has been invited to dis, uh, to dis, uh, invite them. That seems to me to be le leading to a kind of surrender, uh, to, uh, mobs. Mm -hmm. So every time I see a, disinvitation, I am uh, very, uh, ver uh, very troubled. 
So are you familiar with the work of Jonathan Haidt at yes. New York University? I mean, yeah, so hearing you talk about the work, of, you know, the, 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 the mob mentality, which is particularly easy to spin up you know, with the internet, you know, he, he works deeply on this, this issue of speech on campus and the range of ideas that are acceptable and unacceptable. You know, one of his rules that he's proposed, and we see this violated time and time again at universities, is if there is a, if there is a mob, either in person or virtual, that you should just not give in or respond. You know, create the time between when the mob mobilizes and when an eventual decision is made to, to allow... Um, more space in the conversation. But it does seem like university presidents are constantly, or these invitation uh, invitations being rescinded is constantly happening. I think it's very unfortunate when invitations are rescinded. I think in some cases, it reflects a kind of sloppiness. I don't Agreed. think, I don't think it's, it's very, this is very delicate. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's unreasonable for universities to have the view that commencement is supposed to be a happy time where graduates are celebrated mm -hmm. and that there are a large number of distinguished people who are potential commencement speakers and that commencement is not the moment for major moral divides and to avoid choosing as commencement speakers people who will create enormous division. I don't think anyone with a highly controversial view has a right to be a commencement speaker. Sure. And so it seems to me that if universities were a little more thoughtful before they extended invitations about creating these difficult, about avoiding these difficulties, they often wouldn't face some of the controversies uh, that they uh, face when there is a big uh, uprising um, over, uh, over, over that. Um, so I think it's very difficult, but in general, I think it is um, outrageous when uh, invitations once extended are extend are withdrawn simply because it proves to be controversial. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if, if you want to salute someone, if you extend an invitation to salute someone as a great American, and between the time you extend the invitation and the award ceremony, you learn that they've committed major felonies, mm -hmm. and you withdraw yeah. the invitation. That's in one category. Right. But I think the category that's problematic is when you don't learn anything about the person, you just learn about the reaction uh, within, uh, your, within the, your uh, community. And I think those are very, very difficult, uh, very, very difficult cases. But I think the larger problem probably than the disinvitations is – the failure on many campuses for important points of view to be significantly represented uh, in uh, the debate, whether it's a pro-military uh, view in the United States that's less true today than it was some years ago, whether it's a view that emphasizes the importance of uh, religious uh, values, whether it's a view in support of more traditional conceptions of uh, the family. I think it's very problematic when all views can't be uh, discussed and uh, debated. And it seems to me that the history of efforts to censor in order to protect people from dangerous ideas is a pretty bad one. Yeah. It's a history of um, punitive discrimination, to put it politely, mm -hmm. against uh, gays. 
it's a history of the excesses of the McCarthy period that look almost absurd uh, today. You know, what I always said was that academic freedom is the right to hold any point of view, but academic freedom does not include freedom from criticism. Right. And so I felt that our faculty were prepared to, were had the right to advocate any position they wished, whether I thought it made sense or not, but they didn't have the right to not be criticized for the wrongness of their position. I mean, that's kind of the fundamental or of our that profession. That seemed to me to be the review. basic idea of uh, what, uh, what went on uh, in universities. Mm -hmm. But it's... It's complicated. I remember a case many, many years ago where a business school faculty member argued that it was really fine to let your employees steal some money hmm. because they'd be a bit happier um, because in many cases they were good employees and if you fired them, you'd have to replace them with uh, less good uh, employees and that basically it could be a good strategy to permit modest theft. Okay. With a, a data, and, data supported argument? I mean, it, I mean, yeah, I don't, something. I'm not sure how convincing the data was, but there was an <laughs> attempt at data and all that. And there was a view that since it was a central value of the business school in question to promote ethics, yeah. that that shouldn't be permitted. Hmm. Well, I thought it was pretty clear that professor ought to be able to write that article if he wanted. I think it's more complicated. Another issue that's complicated in the university is, yes, he surely should be able to write that article, but should he be able to teach that hmm. in a required course? Right. And if he teaches it in a required course, should there be any obligation to present the other side? Mm -hmm. And so these are complicated matters where there's no hard and fast judgment. But my view would be that in universities, more ideas, not fewer ideas, more debate, not uh, less uh, debate, respond to the outrageous with refutation, not with censorship, are the right kinds of principles. And as you're laying that out there, and I can't help but not think of the current kind of media environment that most people in the country consume and how polarized that is. And it seems like, you know, this, this, these fundamentals that you are um, espousing here are going to be central to trying to heal political polarization in the populace. I think that's right. I think there is a there is a problem, which is that people are able to choose media that conforms to their prejudices right. rather than choosing media that broadens their perspective. And then it's kind of like a river that digs its own furrow, that uh, people choose a media that reinforces their prejudices, and then they come to hold their prejudices more strongly. Right, it feels And then good. they become narrower in their choice of uh, media. And I think that is something that's very problematic. You know, I, I try to read a weekly magazine from both the far left and the pretty far uh, right because I think it's much more useful to me to read things that tell me that what I would like to think is badly wrong than right. to read things that uh, tell me that my preconceptions are correct. It would seem as an, a, a bit of an obligation as an educator to, to have that value in the way you I, curate information I for think your students. It is an, I think it is an obligation to cause people to always think it's not so, it's not, so simple. Right. And I think there's a particular tendency when an issue becomes uh, engaged with justice for people to think uh, that uh, 
it is uh, it is simple. Um, you know, one of the first things I did um, as president of Harvard, and it caused a fair amount of controversy, was I attended an award ceremony where we gave an award for public service to some terrific individual who had worked at an NGO and had done really powerful advocacy on some environmental issue. Sure. I said I thought that was terrific public service, and I was really glad we had given that award. But that I hoped next year we would also give an award to someone who had worn a uniform. Hmm. And police uniform, a fire uniform, a military uniform. This was at that time. I reminded people that the only people who had been going up the stairs on 9-11 yeah. were people wearing uniforms and that there was a tendency, particularly in some of the very elite Ivy League kind of academic communities, to disparage those who wore uniforms and to think that the police were mostly people who committed gratuitous violence rather than people who kept us safe, albeit uh, imperfectly. And uh, that those kinds of values and perspectives needed to be represented and honored in universities as well. Absolutely. Well, Larry, gosh, I mean, there are so many things I would love to pick your brain about, but we are catching you at the beginning of a very long day. You're, gener you're donating a ton of time here to the University of Montana community, and I don't want to keep you away from those obligations, but thank you for stopping by the podcast and sharing your thoughts on all of these topics, and uh, enjoy your time in Montana. Very glad to be here at the university. Thank you. Okay, I enjoyed that conversation with Larry immensely, and I hope you did as well. Such a great honor to uh, spend some time with him. Okay, coming up next week, we've got Professor Sarah Rinfrey. Sarah is a dear colleague here, and the two of us collaborate on the University of Montana Big Sky Poll. And we are in the midst of publishing the results of our fall polling cycle. So very much in the news right now, and I will be breaking down those poll results with Professor Rinfrey and look forward to bringing that conversation to you next week. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And remember that this podcast was brought to you by CED, Consolidated Electrical Distributors. They're one of the largest electrical wholesale supply companies in the world with nearly 600 locations. CED is a privately owned business-to-business -business company that distributes just about every piece of equipment you need to keep your lights on, your energy flowing, and your lifestyle comfortable. CED is also an important employer in our community, and they have a keen interest in University of Montana graduates. To explore career opportunities, check out cedcareers.com. Before we go, I'd like to thank a few folks for making this project happen. First off, thanks to Elizabeth Willey, Communications Director here at the University of Montana College of Business. And thanks to our fabulous interns, Mason Dow and Max Gibson. I'd also like to give a special shout out to VTO for providing us with music. And finally, great thanks to my producer, Jeff Meese. As we close, if you have any questions, suggestions, comments, insults, whatever, please email me at anewangle at umontana.edu. Help us spread the word, and be sure to use the hashtag anewangle when you do. Thanks a lot, and see you next time.